Hello everyone and welcome to our seventh workshop in the Embrace the Open series. I am Paola Corti and I am the uh, Open Education Community Manager at uh, Spark Europe, working together with uh, this wonderful uh, group of librarians in the European network of Open Education Librarians. And today we are going to share with you uh, some tips and some resources related to sharing OER. Um, in the room with me, I have Marta Bustillo from University College Dublin in Ireland. So you can picture us around Europe. I'm in Italy, <laughs> for example. We have Camila Kokot Kanikula from Poland, Dansk. And we have Peter Vedal Utnes from uh, the Arctic University of Norway. Uh, thank you to the three of you for being so kind to be willing to share your expertise uh, with your peers and with uh, all other people interested in knowing more about sharing OER. And the floor is yours and uh, if you need me, I'm here. Thank you so much, Paola. Um, so this is Marta Bustillo from University College Dublin. This is the plan for today. Uh, we are going to talk about sharing OER. Uh, the challenges to sharing, learning about uh, how to make, design your OERs to make them open, accessible and shareable, uh, creative commons licenses and platforms to publish OER. And we hope there will be an opportunity for a discussion at the end about your own experiences with trying to share OER and your successes as successes and your challenges. So let's get started. By the end of this workshop, this is what we are hoping that you will have started to do so that you can analyze how far you can share your learning resources, explore the challenges to sharing OER, and identify features during the resource design process that will make it easy for you to make your content open and shareable. Um, we will also hope that you will have started to understand how to select the appropriate license to reuse your materials and also to understand what, which platforms you can use to share your OER and hopefully even to reflect on your own experience of making OER shareable. So, first of all, we wanted to answer this question just to get a sense of where our own audience have shared their OER. So I think Paola has made, made that um, sh uh, link shared. And I'm going to try and add a new share so that I can actually, uh, let's see, I might have to stop sharing for a minute so that I can actually find the link to Answer Garden. And so I can then share the screen again. So, where have you shared your open educational resources, if anywhere? Let's see, I need to keep refreshing this because I know that, okay, so here we go. The Nodo institutional platforms, OER Commons, OnlyFans, Merlo, Peertube, the National Archive, Let's do a little bit of a, a Zotero. Great, all kinds of different platforms. And we hope that by the end of today, you will be able to share, to think of other platforms to share uh, your OERs. Okay, now. Let me go back to our presentation and share the slideshow again. I hope you can see the slideshow, thank you. 
Paola. It's great to have you there. Okay, so there, as, as Paola explained, there are three of us here today. I'm going to do a very brief introduction, like a kind of whirlwind tour of what we're going to cover today. And then my colleagues, Peter and Camilla, will go deeper into each aspect of um, sharing. So just as a reminder, the five R's of openness. So when you create an OER, it's only truly OER if it can be revised, reused, remixed, retained, and redistributed. Today, we're going to focus on the redistribute bit of it. So make it easy to share copies of the original content or revisions or remixes with others. And I thought it was important to mention that in order to share open educational resources, it's not only your willingness to share that is important, it's also important that there is a culture of openness in your institution and also at national level or regional level. So what do I mean by that? I mean that there is a recognition that open educational practices are valuable contributions, contr contributions to teaching and learning in your institution, in your department, in your region, in your country. Also, that copyright and in intellectual property regulations at your local level allow redistribution of educational materials. Because of course, no matter how much you want to share the materials that you create, if your institution does not have policies that encourage that, then you are going to have a, a, an uphill struggle to share your materials. And also that there is a collaboration between, a culture of collaboration between educational institutions at your local level, in your country, in your re region, because if there is already that kind of a culture, then making your, uh, op your educational resources open becomes another piece in that culture of collaboration between educational institutions. So what are the challenges that, that you may have to think about in terms of institutional challenges? Before you can share OER, you must ensure that the software platforms that are supported by your institutions make it easy to share materials. Uh, and I'm mostly talking about uh, the information te uh, technology department in your institution that is willing to support uh, platforms that make it easy to share materials. Also that your local intellectual property and copyright policies facilitates sharing of materials and that there is within your institution a commitment to maintaining open educational resources so that they can be shared in the future. So that there is a commitment to hardware platforms, software platforms, and staffing that allows for that continuing maintenance of open educational resources. Formats are a practical challenge. So when you are thinking about designing your open educational resources, consider a format that allows you to share. If it's a text document or a checklist or an image file or an audio file, what do you need to do to make it easy to share that material? Are you using open software? Um, or is proprietary software the only thing that you have available? And if that's the case, what can you do to make that piece of software able to somehow uh, share your materials? 
And is your format future proof so that if there are updates to the software, can you update your open educational resource so that it's compatible with the newer versions of the software? Things like that. And then, of course, repositories. Starting by, does your institution have an institutional repository? And if it does, what formats, formats does it support? So for instance, in our institution in University College Dublin, the most easily supported format is text related. So it's actually not that easy to upload audio or multimedia. So then does your repository have the storage capacity to handle large multimedia objects? And even if it does, are you yourself able to upload your OER materials into your institutional repository? Or do you know who needs to approve those materials so that they can be incorporated in the institutional repository? So all of those kinds of things can be practical challenges. In terms of intellectual property, I'm not going to say an awful lot because I know that Camila is going to cover a lot of these. But does your institution allow you to use Creative Commons licenses for the material you create? And then if it does, what is the most appropriate license to use for your materials? For instance, if you are remixing, you must abide by the terms of the original license. Can that be done or do you need to reconsider the overall license that you are applying so that you can remix? Or for instance, if you are creating open educational resources as part of a funded project, do your funders require that you use a specific license for redistribution? These are all things that you need to think about. Okay, and now we are going to delve deeper into all of those um, aspects of sharing OER. And I'm going to let my colleague, Peter, to start talking about the challenges to sharing OER. So Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marta. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, okay, we can good. hear you. I am um, uh, Petter Vedalutnes from the Arctic University of Norway. Um, I will talk about some, some uh, common objections and, and misconceptions uh, about the sharing of OER. And I will, in fact, not repeat the points that were raised by Marta. Uh, my, the points I'm discussing are a bit different. Um, <clears throat> I've gathered these objections and concerns by asking people about their uh, ideas and concerns at a workshop, uh, which I had on, particularly on the uh, challenges to sharing OER. Uh, and also a few workshop meetings or uh, working group meetings with representatives from the faculties at my university. Uh, so the following is not based on statistics, it's just uh, taxonomy I've made by talking to, to people. Um, the first point, uh, which um, I have heard several versions of, is that legal complexities are, are um, just too much, so that, so that it, it is not worth it. Uh, for example, one professor in telemedicine uh, said that he had gotten huge bills from Getty Images after uploading his PowerPoint lectures. Um, that sort of thing. And um, also concerns about students' anonymity, various uh, concerns like that. Um, but generally, if you educate yourself on fair use, uh, public domain and, and uh, Creative Commons zero, as it's called, uh, you will get far using only those. Um, of course, Camilla will talk more about licenses. But my, my um, takeaway from, from 
reading up on the matter is that it's better to focus on what can be shared and do that uh, and not uh, be worried about sharing everything. Because if we try to to get a grip on everything at once, um, it will the costs will not outweigh the benefits from the point of view of uh, someone sharing their OERs. <clears throat> and the second point is that uh, OER sharing needs advanced technical skills. And it does need some skills, um, depending on the resource. But um, there are many guides out there, some of which I will, I will, uh, or will be shared in this PowerPoint. And um, <clears throat> it is important to remember that it, it's mostly analogous to publishing your own research, such as formatting a document and uploading it. And most of the concerns are, such as accessibility and licenses, could concern you in your research and, and teaching anyway, even if you only give it to students. So it's not an extra in that sense. Um, and there's a perception of OER as low quality, which seems to be connected to the fact that they are free and that there is no system of peer review, which is um, sort of true. But um, unlike with a, with a paper, it's, it's um, very common for for educators to have um, to want to share something that that they have already taught in a class before, and so they have had, had practical feedback from the classroom and from the res results of the students and that sort of thing, which is often much more much better quality control than than a mere peer review. Um, <clears throat> and the last two points are that uh, digital resources may not stand alone. Um, and the material is not good enough or is not suitable. Um, these are related and, and frequent concerns that I've heard, um, <clears throat> especially when it comes to lecture plans, slides, and, and course material like this. The worry is that the, the students or, or teachers who reuse them will not interpret them correctly because they are normally explained in, explained in the classroom in person. Um, also, for the same reason, they might seem to be of poor quality. Um, but anyone who has made such material will know this. So, in my opinion, we sort of don't extend the same uh, understanding to others that we would extend to ourselves, in the sense. It, it's implicitly understood that uh, um, slides and such things aren't um, able to stand on their own as a replacement for the classroom setting, or even less as a replacement for meetings with a supervisor or tutoring. <clears throat> um, OK, uh, the next slide, please, Marta. OK. Thank you. And these uh, are concerns that I think are uh, more um, uh, serious and, and uh, which shouldn't be dismissed. Um, and the first one is the unclear, unclear division of labor and responsibility. Uh, this might be a problem, especially at my institution. I don't know. I can only speak from our point of view. But it's a very confusing to to figure out who, has, who is responsible for, I mean, uh, library staff or tech support or, or faculty for any kind of thing that comes up, such as um, I mean, stuff to do with curation and archiving issues and suitability of uh, OER and problems with licenses, anything, uh, really. Uh, it's very unclear who to turn to. I assume that this is a problem uh, elsewhere as well. And for the intellectual property and remixing concerns, um, this also might be a particular debate for Norway. But um, most definitions of OER uh, including the five R's that Marta mentioned earlier, include the adaptable or remixable clause. And there's been a debate here about um, the downside of uh, the most open licenses in that they allow other people to use your uh, text, the, your concrete text, uh, outside the realms of fair use, and, and but still change the context so that the integrity of the work is threatened or uh, concerns like that. So essentially, it's about uh, non-derivative type licenses. 
and um, because um, there is an expectation that you will use the CC BY license, which um, Camilla will explain later. So I think this is a, a valid concern, uh, even though I do, even though you could still say that it is open, even if it is non-derivative, just because it's not behind the paywall. Of course, it would be less open. And the last one is, is it about cost reduction and efficiency or about quality? And several people have uh, uttered the skepticism to me that um, if we focus on cost reduction and efficiency, quality will be will be lost. Uh, and the reason for that is it's not a given that the time saved will be reinvested into uh, further developing the educational resource. Of course, it could be just uh, lost that time you save and um, put to other use. So I think that that's a, that's a valid concern and something we should should keep in mind. Um, the next slide, please, Marta. And lastly, the problem of of incentives that we are discussing a lot uh, is um, institutional support and uh, the recognition and reward for for creators of OERs. Uh, I had one such case in a in a journal I was editing, OER journal. Um, it was a beautiful book that. Um, didn't receive any credit because it didn't sort of um, align with the publication in in a, one of the ranked journals, and it wasn't any other kind of clearly recognizable scientific contribution, nor was it uh, considered a um, textbook for a specific course. So in the end, the the author gets no no credit, no tangible credit, um, nor do they get any kind of promotion since the journal has no resources for that, and it doesn't have an obvious readership since it's an OER journal and not, as the case was, a pedagogy journal. So there's no, there's really no tangible benefits to the author, um, except, of course, the permanent link as a DOI. That's the only thing. So, um, so the, the, many people just uh, state quite plainly that the, um, the cost benefit does not work out in favor of publishing their resources. So, um, yeah, that's a challenge for the institutions to to have clear uh, reward structures in place, and not just. I mean, they are there on paper uh, in Norway, but they aren't uh, implemented in any way that feels tangible. All right, uh, that's it. Okay. Thank you, Marta. So we're now going to talk a little bit about designing OERs for openness, accessibility, and shareability. Pleasure. Okay. Um, this is the uh, checklist um, I have used myself when when I was working uh, with open access journals and. Um, specifically with speech, speech synthesis. Uh, the first one is choose an accessible font. I guess maybe typeset is the correct word. Uh, that, that's essentially, it means uh, choosing, um, I think the English word is letter forms, a font or typeset with the correct letter um, forms that have good contrast, so it's easy to read for um, the visually impaired or, or with for uh, people with dyslexia or similar reading. Uh, uh, challenges. I think um, examples of such fonts are uh, Arial or Helvetica um, and a few others. Mm. And the second uh, is make sure the document is semantically structured. And by that I mean making sure that your headings are marked as headings. Uh, that paragraph is marked in, as normal and so on in a hierarchical way. I'll get back to the to the point of this in the next slide. And uh, make sure you have alt text, which makes sure that you have uh, text that explains your figures, tables, and images in an, an understandable way for people who use assistive technology, so that it will be read up in, and uh, it will make sense. 
in most uh, programs, whether it's for Calibre or Word or PowerPoint, you can just right click the image and just add alt text. Uh, sometimes it's hidden under properties. Um, and the same is for captions and transcripts for the same reason, that's important. If you do video or audio uh, OERs. Adapting language for non-native speakers um, essentially makes, essentially you, you will have to simplify your English to make it understandable uh, depending on the target audience. And um, in some cases, of course, translation, if, there are, if that's an option. And um, almost all um, software used to generate OERs, such as PowerPoint, Word, HTML editors, Adobe Acrobat, or Camtasia, or Calibre, or LibreOffice, um, all of these have accessibility uh, tools integrated that allow you to check see if you've remembered to put in alt text or and remember to use headings um, to, to structure the document so um yeah okay next next slide please Marta. and the um for example when when people use um, assistive technology um they are often used um something that is called uh, tabbing, uh, which is when you press tab on your keyboard, you will jump to the next heading in a document uh, or the next uh, button, if there are several buttons that can be clicked. So the reason why you want uh, semantically structured documents is that uh, when people navigate documents using this method, they will, you will want them to uh, go in a logical manner through the document itself from heading to heading and not skip to skip in, in uh, strange ways, or if you have just manually formatted your heading, you will just skip straight down to the end instead. It would be very unmanageable for assistive technology. Um, there are essentially two kinds of, of uh, assistive technology that are used by, especially the visually impaired, which is screen readers or document readers. And if they use document readers, screen readers just read whatever is on your screen, uh, and then you can skip to the next heading. But if they use uh, document readers, which often have better speech synthesis, then um, they will often want to f um, convert the document to their uh, their preferred um, format, such as EPUB or PDF or whatever. And then it's very also important to have them semantically structured. Otherwise, the conversion will result in a mess. Sorry. Yeah. And the uh, resources I have provided at the bottom here are, um, are um, uh, themselves contain links to various resources. So um, they are quite useful. One is UNESCO's uh, uh, briefing paper. The other one is uh, uh, WCAG's guidelines. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Peter. I'm going to introduce a little bit of an example of how in UCD we have tried to make our resources more accessible. And so we have been for the last few months working on an online course that is an optional course that students at uh, University College Dublin can do to improve their digital skills for the workplace. So it's called Digital Skills for Success in the Workplace. And it has a set of five interactive tutorials that students can do to help them develop those skills. This is an example. Uh, it's a tutorial called Co-Creating in Digital Spaces. And as you can see at the bottom there, it says, at the end of each section, you will find audio versions of the content, as well as Word and PDF text files to help you access the material in the most helpful format for you. And um, just as Peter was saying, we have used a piece of software that checks all the basic accessibility things like 
old text for images and semantic structuring and all of those things. However, we are using proprietary software because this is what our institution uses. And we were very conscious that because we were using Articulate Rise to create those tutorials, if we wanted to share these as open educational resources, um, we would have to find some other format to share the content because the Articulate tutorial files can be shared as files themselves, but they cannot be edited, they cannot be remixed, this kind of thing. So what we did was we added audio and plain text versions of all of the text in the tutorials that we will then share in the, in the project website so that everybody can just download the, the text and copy and paste it for their own uh, purposes. So this is what it looks like. Um, and all of the units in the tutorials have this. They have the script and they have the audio version of, of the tutorial. Um, but having said that, one of the reasons why we were able to do this was that we were working with a group of students and one of our students had accessibility needs herself and had become a specialist in creating audio and text files for other people too. So she was able to do this really quickly in a really professional way and it was easy. But sometimes this is not so easy. So it's something that you need to consider but um, that can take time and resources to be able to do it. So just something to consider. Okay, so we're going to move on to the rights discussion, um, CC licenses and other options. And I'm going to hand over to my uh, colleague, Camila to do this. Thank you very much, um, Marta and uh, Peter, for your very interesting thoughts. And uh, now, uh, here uh, in this part, uh, I would like to present you licenses uh, that are uh, the most often uh, chosen for OER. So uh, I will present you a CC uh, Creative Commons licenses and also two other options, uh, which are a public domain and a CC0 license. And uh, let's look on the situation uh, when the author decides um, what type of license uh, to choose for sharing and uh, what does it mean for her and for uh, for him. So thank you, Marta, for another slide. Here, as you can see, we have uh, six uh, different uh, Creative Commons licenses from the most open uh, to the most restrictive and uh, depends uh, on what you choose as an author, uh, you will grant specific, uh, specific permissions to your users. So let's start from the first, from the most open license, which is CC BY. And uh, if you choose this license, um, your users um, uh, will be able to uh, distribute, to remix and uh, adapt, and also build upon your work Mm, even commercially, uh, as long as they credit you uh, for the original creation. And as I, to as I told you, uh, this is the most open license. Uh, another is CC by SA. Uh, so uh, this license um, allows for uh, doing exactly the same things as uh, CC by license. But mm, all new versions of your work and all, all new works uh, should carry exactly the same license, which is CC by SA. Uh, another license mm, is CC by NC. 
and uh, this license, uh, if you choose this license, uh, your users uh, would be able to do um, distribute, uh, to uh, share, uh, to, oh my God, <laughs> to change and, and remix, uh, sorry, <laughs> and uh, remix um, as long as they credit you for the original creation, but uh, they cannot be they cannot sell uh, they work uh, because this is a non-profit uh, non-profit uh, license and another license is cc by um, ncsa um, so here uh, as the same as with previous uh, with with previous uh, license uh, they will be able to distribute to change remix and build uh, upon your work uh, but non-commercially um, and uh, all new works uh, should have be able uh, should be able to um, carry the same uh, license uh, so uh, cc by and csa and uh, last two licenses first one is cc by nd um, so here if you pick this uh, this license um, your users uh, your users uh, can only distribute commercially or non-commercially, uh, but uh, you don't give permission for making any changes uh, and uh, for um, for remixes. Uh, so you have to your users have to uh, put your uh, your work in original version. And a last uh, license is the most um, restrictive. So uh, here, this is permission only for uh, sharing, for downloading, uh, but you don't uh, grant permission to remixing, uh, to um, uh, make any changes and use commercially. Uh, yes, I know I made some... Uh, <laughs> As I said uh, before this uh, uh, this meeting, I'm a little bit stressed, so sorry for that. But uh, I hope uh, you understand what I already said. So uh, we can change uh, this slide. Hold on, Camila. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is. Here we go. Oh, thank you. So. Um... You have two another options uh, to share your uh, your uh, your works. Uh, so uh, first one is uh, public domain. So uh, public domain, uh, if you choose it, uh, so um, it uh, it means uh, that uh, your works or works that you found uh, on the internet. Uh, are um, are free without uh, copyright um, copyright um, protection, and uh, it can be uh, for for example to uh, in in two situations. So uh, when um, uh, when the copyright protection has expired, uh, and uh, when. <clears throat> uh, the work uh, that you found uh, is another subject uh, of uh, copyright protection. And the last uh, license is CC0. We are talking about it uh, when, for example, uh, the author waives uh, their copyright uh, before copyright protection uh, expires. And uh, all through uh, no... Um, attribution is required, uh, it's a good practice to give credit to the author. And this is all about uh, licenses. Um, so next slide, please. Here, uh, here you can see a summary uh, about all licenses. So in one place, uh, you have all informations about licenses, uh, about using and sharing. But um, 
I have to do uh, one exception because the last column uh, suggests uh, that uh, some licenses might be changed, but it might be not applicable in your uh, case. Uh, for example, Marta uh, mentioned about it. Uh, when your institution um, uses uh, only one specific uh, license uh, for distributing uh, their uh, documents and materials. And uh, when your granting institution uh, has um, specific uh, requirements and they can be uh, changed. So please keep in mind all these limitations. Next slide, please. Okay. So now it's time for a short quiz. Uh, Paola prepared for you uh, some uh, tricky questions, I think. <laughs> but uh, I, I hope that you will have fun uh, to, yes, uh, to um, fill in. Uh, so if you want, you can, uh, you can take uh, part in our quiz. We will give you uh, a few uh, some time uh, to uh, fill in. Camila, can you see that form? Yes, yes, I can okay. see form. So, so this this is the the form that you can fill in. Yeah, and I think uh, after I don't know one. So two minutes, uh, we can uh, we can explain the uh, questions. I really enjoyed when I uh, when I made this uh, uh, this um, quiz. So I hope. You will do have fun. <laughs> okay, uh, I think Marta that we can start to explaining. Oh, okay, do you want me to stay on the form? And yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you if you can, let's look on the first question. Uh, so first question uh, is no, because uh, you want to profit from uh, from uh, your uh, presentation. So we can't remix non-commercial license with uh, commercial uh, using. Uh, so um, here we should uh, tick no. Uh, another question, second question. Thank you, Marta. Should I read it or not? <laughs> because I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, let's read it. I can read it for you, Camila. Oh, no, 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 I can read it. <laughs> uh, can you remix a CC by and CSA resource by Xavier with one of your CC by SA resources? And. I oh, Camila. Oh, goodness. Let's wait a moment while Camilla comes back. <laughs> yes, I, I was wondering whether it was my internet or hers. Oh, it was hers, maybe. Welcome back, Camilla. <laughs> oh, oh, you, you couldn't uh, hear me. I'm sorry. No. Uh, so here, uh, another, here is uh, the answer, yes. Uh, because you as a creator, uh, you can change uh, your uh, your license. Uh, so um, yeah, and uh, the third question: um, Can you remix a CC by NCSA resource by Xavier with a CC by SA uh, resource by In Ignacio? No. Uh, because uh, they they should have exactly the same resource from uh, Xavier should have a license CC by should carry uh, CC by and CSA license and a resource by Ignacio uh, should have still CC by SA so we can't remix together these two uh, licenses. 
And the last question, can you remix a CC BY ND resource by David with a CC BY resource by anyone? Uh, it's also no, the answer is no, uh, because we have to keep a resource, David's resource uh, in original uh, version. So yeah, this is all from me. Okay. Hold on a minute, then. Let's go back to the presentation. Yes, thank you. Great. Mm, so, uh, next slide, please, Marta. Okay. And now I'm going to tell you more about uh, platforms where you can publish your uh, OER. And uh, I will tell you say more about uh, each of them uh, and uh, Marta, me and Peter, uh, we have picked uh, some platforms, three platforms from our countries and uh, I hope you will like them too. Uh, so next slide please. Okay, uh, I decided to uh, make a short introduction about uh, institutional repository, but Marta al already uh, has done it, uh, so <laughs> we can skip it, uh, but uh, one exception. Mm, I know uh, that sometimes you have uh, no, um, no, um, no option, and uh, you have to upload uh, your uh, your OERs into your institutional repository. So you can't, for example, uh, decide about license or uh, about the openness uh, of your uh, educational resource. But everything here, what you can see on the scre screen, is uh, also important. Uh, so, um, yes, at first you have to find, you have to check whether your institution accepts uh, OERs and uh, what type of conditions uh, you have to meet, to submit. And, and finally, uh, are you okay uh, with this uh, with this uh, with these conditions? Uh, and if you can decide or not, <laughs> if you can decide, it's good to consider another uh, platforms. And next slide, please. And my first recommendation will be Zenodo. I know that it appeared uh, during our answer garden. So it's very good uh, that it's here. And uh, Zenodo mm, is a general uh, repository mm, when uh, everyone can upload uh, their resource. And I think that uh, we all love Zenodo uh, in NOL because uh, almost all our resources can be found there. And um, I think that Zenodo has uh, many, um, many um, advantages. Uh, for example, uh, you can upload there uh, many forms of OER. Uh, you uh, can decide whether you want uh, open publicity open your uh, your resource or keep it uh, close um, or mm, it has really uh, user friendly uh, user friendly interface and uh, also there is a pos possibility of versioning of versioning i'm sorry and all materials uh, get doi identifier mm, but i know Ah, and there is uh, and there is a possibility to watch a uh, user uh, statistic, usage statistics. So, uh, so it's also a good mm, feature. Uh, but sometimes uh, you can face some challenges, and uh, I think the most common uh, are mm, uh, the difficulty in searching and also overwhelming of the uh, amount of the uh, resources. Because as I told you, uh, Zenodo, it's very huge. Uh, we can find many, uh, many uh, resources there. That's why I think uh, you should test uh, Zenodo and other platforms and find your uh, own uh, way. Uh, so another slide, please. Mm, 
Mm -hmm. uh, to help you to pick the right uh, platform, uh, I present. I was. I selected uh, some uh, some examples, and um, depends on the um, depends on the forms of the types uh, that uh, you can find and upload there. But please keep in mind uh, that some of them are. OER's repositories, so not only one type of uh, resource uh, can be um, uploaded there, but for two first uh, two first examples, uh, which are Coursera and edX, uh, I think you know well, them very well uh, because they are uh, types of um, massive open online courses and uh, because they are so well known, it's good to know that uh, your institution uh, can join uh, to this uh, huge uh, project and uh, and uh, promote their own resources to a wider uh, audience. And uh, when you decide to join to Coursera or edX, uh, your uh, resources uh, will be as available as those from uh, Harvard, from uh, Stanford or uh, from Cambridge University. Uh, and now it's uh, my suggestion, suggestion from Poland, uh, it calls Navojka. Uh, this is also a platform with massive open online courses, uh, but it's a non-commercial uh, non project that uh, everyone can join to this project uh, without any fees. Uh, so here you can find um, mostly uh, courses in Polish. But uh, there is um, more than uh, five, uh, 50, more than 50, more than 50 courses uh, in English and some courses in uh, Ukrainian. So uh, especially now it might be important. And uh, the last the last platform here is Merlot, but uh, it was created uh, in 1997 uh, as a OER's repository. So here you can upload uh, many types of OER uh, from uh, open online courses uh, to um, uh, to. Uh, Animations, animations, of course. <laughs> uh, and uh, another slide, please. Okay, now it's time for uh, textbooks. So my first, uh, my first uh, recommendation, first platform that I want to present is a directory of open access books. Mm, I think you know that uh, that platform, but it's good to know uh, that uh, only publishers uh, can submit their books, uh, and uh, it has very rich uh, catalog with more than uh, seventy eight thousand of books, and uh, this project is. Um, is created by uh, several. Uh, research institutions so it's proven it's verified so it's very very good uh, source uh, for yours uh, for your uh, books and uh, another platform is open textbook uh, library so uh, here um, this platform offers more than one uh, 1500 uh, books and not only publishers, but also authors can suggest their uh, resources, uh, and they have to be uh, they have to be um, original. They have to be open licensing and uh, also in portable file. Uh, and this project is. Um, is uh, supported by uh, Center of uh, Open Education uh, of the University of Minnesota. And the last, uh, last platform on this slide is Rebus Press. Uh, this is a, a press book network uh, and 
uh, it produces uh, textbooks uh, under CC BY license and um, your institution can become a member uh, to this community and uh, in that way can contribute, it might uh, contribute uh, to the creation uh, of textbooks. Okay, next slide, please. Lecture slides and, uh, and photos uh, are uh, another types of OER that I want to present. So uh, first uh, recommendation is from Marta. This is a national forum, uh, uh, national resource hub. Oh, okay. National Resource Hub. Uh, it is an OER repository, and I have to read it because it's very long name of the on the of the institution. So this is a repository of National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning in Higher Education in Ireland. <laughs> so yeah, and. Um, here, uh, Irish institution can submit their uh, resources and also users can browse uh, uh, in a growing range of uh, resources. And uh, as I know, uh, more and more uh, institution join to this, uh, to this uh, project. Uh, so you can always uh, check uh, and maybe you will find something that you, uh, you find interesting. In addition to lecture slides, photos, and also presentation, uh, also video materials, also books uh, can be uh, uploaded there. Uh, so not only uh, lecture slides and photos, but uh, also other uh, resources you can find there. Uh, slide share. Slide share is a um, commercial commercial service uh, where infographics when your uh, presentation uh, can be shared and uh, it's good to know that uh, you can create a, a paid uh, or free account and uh, and what Yes, and you can upload your files uh, privately and publicity, depends on, on your needs. Uh, and two last uh, uh, are connected, especially with photos, with videos. So Flick, uh, I think that you know it's very well. Uh, because it's the one of the most famous platform in this, uh, in this um, kind. So uh, here, because it's so well known, uh, it's good to know that you can promote your uh, your um, photos, your illustrations um, on this on this platform. Uh, and uh, here you can also you have also uh, two options. You can create uh, a free account or paid account. And Pixabay, uh, I think. I don't. I. I. I'm not sure. Uh, do you know this? Uh, know this uh, platform? But I put it here because it might be a good alternative to Flickr, uh, because it's a very similar platform uh, to Flickr. But as I told you, maybe uh, some of you don't know it. Uh, so it's good to know that Pixabay exists. <laughs> and another slide please. Okay, so this is my last recommendation. Uh, if you wish to share your music, your podcast or your video materials, uh, you can consider following services. For example, first of them is CC Mixer. Uh, this is a community uh, music recording site. Uh, everything what you can find there uh, is um, available under Creative Commons licenses. That's why the name. Uh, and it's no, it's good to know. Mm, you should you should know before you start. Uh, before you start oh, sharing, it's okay. <laughs> before you start sharing, that uh, you will have to decide uh, 
uh, and and uh, choose Creative Commons licenses for your uh, material. Uh, DRL, uh, this platform was suggested by uh, Peter, and this is a Norwegian OER repository. And uh, here you can find and uh, upload uh, material like video, like, um, like, like audio material, uh, as well as uh, other, completely other different uh, types of OER. And uh, another site is Smooth Open. Uh, here uh, you will able to share your music recordings, uh, your sheet music, and uh, your educational materials uh, for students and teachers. And uh, here, uh, Creative Commons licenses uh, also valid. Uh, so uh, yeah, as as you know, as you can hear, uh, Creative Commons uh, are matter. So so we need to know them. And the last uh, last but not the least on the <laughs> on this slide is YouTube mm, because uh, I think it. Uh, shouldn't uh, been missing from our list and uh, NOL uh, also uses uh, to share our own resources especially our videos and our podcast so that's why it's here and this is all from me <laughs> thank you Camila thank you okay so A lot of information to absorb and a lot of different topics covered. So we were hoping that you would be able to then discuss your own challenges. And Marta, you are mute. You are mute. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. <laughs> So I was saying a lot of information to absorb, a, a lot of uh, topics have been covered in, in this workshop. So it's now your time to reflect from what you have heard and from your own experiences. So we were hoping that you could talk about your successes and your challenges using this Padlet. And um, so I'm going to stop sharing for a minute because I'm in full screen here on the presentation. Actually, let me see if it, if it lets me, no, I have to stop sharing for a second. Okay, so let's have a look at the Padlet. Uh, hold on a minute. Yes. And I can share this again. So we have two sections in the Padlet, one for challenges and one for successes. So we would love to hear from you about your own experiences of trying to share OER. So let's have a look. Deal with the complexities of choices, especially when uploading materials created by others in my institution. Yes. Because if it's others, then you have no control. And that means that it's actually tricky to ascertain that the right Creative Commons licenses have been chosen or the right software or anything else. Uh, so three options there. Uh, what are your successes? That's fantastic when people come back letting you know that they they find your resources really useful and how they have reused them. That is brilliant. Yes. And I have to like it because it's very good uh, a point. <laughs> I'm going to like it myself. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, we have. telling me something yeah. that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. 
Okay, let's give it a few minutes to let people put in their own comments and their own successes and challenges. Um, and then we can maybe stop sharing and, and go back to the participants and see what people talk about and maybe explain a little bit more about what you have put into the paddle. I would like add something because uh, from my last uh, from my last uh, experiences because during uh, open education a week uh, I had uh, two webinars for our students but uh, mostly they uh, they was there was uh, our uh, teachers and so after uh, after my uh, my and my colleague because we do it together uh, so after that uh, one of the teacher come back came back to me and he said that he found something that he will definitely use during uh, his own uh, his own um, classes uh, so it was great to hear something like this because uh, this uh, webinar was for for that uh, to show people uh, that something like OER exists. Yeah, I, Camila, I, I completely agree. I, sometimes people either don't know very much about uh, open education or they have, you know their own biases against uh, open education and then sometimes you can kind of en entice people to our side mm -hmm. um, and i'm seeing some lovely things coming up uh, in the successes the opportunity to discuss how to make resources more visible works both ways yes so you're sharing something but it also means that you're being recognized which is good and here at a conference that people recommend online courses to their students. That's brilliant. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay. If it's okay with you, I will stop sharing. I'm sure people can add things to the Padlet if they think of them. Um, but I'm going to stop sharing. And it would be lovely if participants can maybe turn on the cameras if you can, or if not, just talk and explain a little bit more about what you think of your challenges and your uh, successes. I should own up and say that the one about uh, finding uh, software to share interactive tutorials was me. Uh, and that's because my institution had already decided to use articulate rice and so therefore i had the challenge of on the one hand i can share the rice files and they can be embedded anywhere but they cannot be edited unless someone has a subscription to articulate rice in which case they can go into it and change it any way they want but so that was why we went down the route of sharing plain text uh, documents with basically all the outline of the tutorials because then somebody else can choose a different piece of software copy and paste our text copy and paste our images and and just go that way you know paola <laughs> AI, yes, because I, I totally agree with this challenge, honestly, because uh, even with the best intentions, we have always to keep in mind that being open doesn't mean, uh, in the way that we interpret it, of course, in this context, uh, doesn't mean that we have to be radically open to start. A good start can be finding good open ways 
to avoid the barriers, right? And enable yeah. others anyway, because uh, this is something that happens very often also uh, in my institution, Politecnico di Milano, with my second head on, um, we use uh, um, proprietary software to develop uh, the videos in our MOOCs. And the whole process in place is wrapped around the steps required by this proprietary software. So when we want to share the, the final result, it's okay. We share, we share it with an open license, but uh, it's quite different from being able to change the pieces of the video. And uh, when we experiment about uh, being more radical with our open approach, uh, let's say that uh, we have plenty of opportunities to discuss about uh, costs, about the time, the timing of pro producing the same video with open softwares and about uh, finding repositories that are welcoming with large uh, large uh, files, as you were saying before, Marta. So I agree that uh, it's an interesting topic to continue discussing about because there are benefits in both. Uh, it depends on the main, I think that the, the main, the key is the purpose and enable other anyways. So I appreciate your choice at UCD to share plain text. Why not? People can reuse it and adapt it, making it more good looking, more convincing, add other media, but it's up to them yeah. to invest. So does anyone else want to share their experience of sharing OER? And Paola, maybe we could stop the recording for the discussion. It's okay. I think it's up to participants and maybe I can pause it for a moment, but it's not a problem. I mean, if they are willing to share um, anyway is good, either by chat or by, or by opening their microphone. Mm -hmm. Better to have them. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's have a look and see if there's anything else. Yeah, so I'm really curious about the comment about re dealing the complexities of choices when other people are creating materials in your institution. Um, and maybe, I don't know who placed that, quest that comment, but maybe you could explain a little bit more. Because Peter, I think it relates to what you were talking about earlier about who, about kind of the the burden of the work, who takes responsibility for what, and who do you turn to for help with one thing or another? You know that if you are responsible for an open educational initiative, then people can turn to you for help with creating their open educational resources. And maybe you can have some influence on the choices that people make. But if there is no kind of official support for an open education initiative, then it becomes a lot more, I suppose, unclear uh, who does what and who is responsible for what? I don't know what you think about this. The questions are so different. Depends on if uh, if you're uh, if you're unsure about uh, accessibility considerations, or if you're worried about uh, getting the correct metadata or something technical like that, or whether you were worried about licenses. Um, mm. I'm not sure how it is in other institutions, but here in uh, 
strong so it's um, it's very hard to find out who to ask you yeah yes i know exactly what you mean we are we are a little bit in the same situation in ucd particularly because when it comes to licenses strictly speaking we, we should probably talk to our legal team but I don't think anybody ever has the time to do that, <laughs> you know? Um, so, yeah. For our journals and for our repositories, such as, as it is, it's not a very good archive. Uh, but, uh, I mean, the um, questions go to the uh, editor or the technical editor, uh, and uh, they will not have the time to to help someone uh, separate their document or or material into uh, cor the correct form, um, it would be much, way too much work. So you would only state the requirements. And then, uh, of course, it's up to the creator to then find out how to do these things. But um, for many people, I imagine that, that would be too, too, too big an ask, I guess. So, um, there is yeah. the comment in, in the Padlet about meet all requirements. I mean, I don't know you guys, but I don't know anybody that I have spoken to who are trying to create open educational resources who can actually deliver all of the requirements. I think you always have to make compromises. And in a way, the planning designing your resource should take into consideration that you will have to compromise. I mean, I don't know anybody else, but like, in my case, I I have to compromise with the software, um, but there's always, you kind of think of the ways around in a way. Not only I agree, but I would stress the fact that uh, uh, compromise should be at the top <laughs> keywords <laughs> for all the work that we do. But also, what is in your control to do? What isn't? Yeah. And if something is in your control, even raising awareness while you contribute to um, uh, helping someone would be already something great. Because maybe that's not the the timing yet but uh, what you share while you support uh, uh, content creators might be useful the, ne the next time mm -hmm. and uh, so I really think that uh, uh, you um, can support uh, um, content creators quite largely uh, so that's I I've also would love to ask you a question how often uh, the three of you, for example, who are facilitating this workshop today, are contacted by teachers or researchers who are willing to publish something openly or are starting to consider it as an option uh, to ask key questions. How often does it happen? Um... I have to confess, in our case, it doesn't yet happen because we haven't really launched a, a service to support that kind of um, support academics who are doing this yet. Um, but I do get questions from sometimes from colleagues in other institutions or from colleagues within UCD library because they know I'm in that space and they they think that I can answer questions. <laughs> sometimes I can and sometimes I can't. But, you know, it's it's that, it's, as usual, you start small and, you know, you develop as far as you can. But it's not, I mean, I, in other organizations in the ENOL, there are entire departments that are focused on open education and open access. So it's a different thing. 
I am actually, I have actually had uh, many such, uh, I've been contacted many times uh, about that, but that is because the, um, the uh, even though I am new in this position, I've only been here for four or five months, but it's because of the journal, I, I think it has some appeal to publish um, your textbook or, um, yeah, essentially it's just textbooks to publish them in, in the journal to get uh, reviewed and to get an OER and, or I mean a DOI and a registered publication. So there have been many submissions there. And, uh, and of course the, um, <clears throat> as, it, as it happens, uh, usually the editor will have to do much, much more work than, uh, than is uh, ideal. So, the technical staff at the journal and, and the editor will uh, help the authors with uh, everything to do with accessibility and metadata and that sort of thing and licenses but uh, that's not sustainable so um, yeah it's a problem <clears throat> good guides are are required to we haven't got those up and going yet in norwegian <clears throat> I don't get uh, such uh, uh, such questions because we are using in my institution we use a model uh, to uh, disseminate uh, our uh, our resources, especially courses, and uh, all of them almost all of them are uh, close. Uh, so our uh, um, our mm, teachers, our academic staff, uh, don't think about reusing and uh, about uh, sharing so <laughs> that's why for uh, in my institution open education and especially open educational resources it's uh, very uh, the, the the knowledge is uh, very low so i can say that i i i'm doing first steps in this uh, in this area Thank you all. <laughs> okay, so maybe if we don't have uh, further questions, we can wrap up. <laughs> okay. Okay, Marta, can you please share again the slides for just a moment? Yes, so that yes, can... I will. Uh, let me just get back to the slides. Uh... Yeah, it's, this is just an invitation for you to uh, consider joining us in the next uh, episodes of our workshop series. Uh, the next one will be on the 4th of June in the afternoon, and the focus will be on how to start an institutional open education project uh, in order for us to explore some first steps that you might want to start uh, uh, thinking about and uh, who to involve, et cetera, and how to take uh, action. And uh, the following one will be uh, with all the facilitators of this uh, uh, workshop series so far, available for you end of September before uh, the, the, the autumn uh, drives you into the, a very busy period so that you can ask us anything in case you want to go back to our workshop materials, you are thinking about uh, reusing some of the experience or the resources that our facilitators shared. So, and you will have all of us together in a room for one and a half hour uh, and we will be happy to try answering all your questions. And in case we don't have the answers, we will be uh, uh, together trying to find some, uh, either uh, during the workshop itself or later on, and provide them openly to everyone as usual. And then we will have another workshop. We are still in the process of deciding a date for that one, focusing on... Um, the open pedagogy side, so the pedagogical side of the methodology in uh, OER and how they uh, can be reused in practices in order to not only be there as resources, but also as part of the design process to help learners uh, have a more effective experience. 
And uh, you can always find all our slide deck and workshop plans in the Spark Europe uh, collection on Zenodo. These, uh, mat the materials of this workshop will be there too, as soon as I am, uh, as fast as I am to upload them. And uh, the recording of this uh, workshop, as soon as edited, will be available in the Embrace the Open playlist on our annual for Open YouTube channel. So thanks again, Marta, Camila, and Peter for your good job today. And thank, uh, thanks to all of you as participants to be here with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.